Hello, I'm Jean-Philippe Courtois, and this is Positive Leadership, uh, the podcast that helps you grow as an individual, as a leader, and ultimately as a global citizen. IKEA has been the world's largest furniture retailer since 2008. Roughly 882 million of us visited IKEA stores last year in 22, driven by IKEA's vision to create a better everyday life for the many people. It is the Inca Group, which brings the IKEA brand to its customers globally. My guest today, Jesper Bradin, the visionary CEO of Inca Group, is well known for his exceptional leadership qualities and unwavering commitment to ambitious, sustainable goals. Under his guidance, uh, Inca Group has not only embraced stakeholder governance, but has also set new benchmarks for corporate sustainability. By 2030, IKEA is committed to only using renewable, renewable and recycled materials and to reduce the company's total climate footprint by an average of 70% per product. That's quite a bit. Yet surprisingly, little is known about demand <laughs> beyond the organization. <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to welcome you and see you back again, uh, Jesper, onto the podcast. Warm welcome, Jesper. Thank you so much for this opportunity and this wonderful introduction. <laughs> so I'd like to start, Jesper, uh, with what I know about your bringing. I, I, I don't know much, but a little bit that you shared in some uh, forums. I think you were born in Gothenburg, very nice city. By the way, I was there mm. in the summertime with my family and went to the islands on the coast. Wonderful, <laughs> wonderful area. And you also had a master's degree in industrial engineering. But can you tell us to start with about your childhood and the way your parents, your family, help define some of your core beliefs, your culture, and at the end of the day, your values and who you are as a person. All right, wow. <laughs> Thank you, that's, that's, uh, that's a very interesting uh, uh, question. And I, now I think, you know, when I reflect upon my childhood, growing, grown up in the 80s in, in Sweden, uh, um, one thing that sticks out for me that I realize uh, now being 50 plus uh, is that there was sort of an era where we all believed in that from now on things will only get better. So mm. yeah. my, my parents uh, had a better life standard than their parents and there was something in mm. uh, passing on the optimism and passing on the belief in that from now on it's going to be uh, uh, better and better. For the next I, generations. I, I, yeah. yeah, you can say mm. it and I, yeah. I think it sits with me also mm. as a um, warm memory of, of those years mm. but also uh, sometimes as a struggle, um, being in a world where things are going up, down, left, right yes. in many yep. aspects and that, uh, that deeply disturbs me and I realize mm. it has a little bit to do with my childhood probably. <laughs> and, and what about this uh, sentiment you just shared about the optimism that we used to have, and say we used to have, for the next generation? Do you have the same for your kids and for the new generation as well? Well, I, I, I with my three teenagers, um, and also with um, being engaged with, the, so we have basically a, a forum of young leaders, young activists, um, some yeah. 25 uh, young leaders, amazing uh, uh, people ranging from 17 to mm. 27 years old. And what I see today is that there is hesitation, there is deep concerns, and there is sometimes mm. even despair and loss of hope that there is a brighter future ahead of us, uh, which uh, impacts me quite deeply, I think, emotionally, mm. not only uh, from the rational side to resolve the issues that we, yeah. we see of the world today, but actually to be a contributor to uh, build hope. And mm -hmm. of course, build hope on the right premises, not only uh, yeah. empty optimism, so to say. Now, we'll come back to the way you, you are definitely enabling to build up uh, <laughs> within the company you lead and outside as well. Maybe a little bit more coming back again to your childhood, Jesper, uh, if, you, if you don't mind, on on maybe one or two values or you know beliefs that you believe you inherited from your parents, mm. either your dad, your mom, sometimes it's a granddad, who knows, <laughs> who's been inspiring you. <laughs> Very good. I think I think uh, one of the things that was, I think even in Sweden in, in those days that was a bit special was that my, the I would say the value of equality was definitely in our mm. family, but not as a politically motivated, but it was more, yeah. I think, the love between my father and mother mm -hmm. made my, my father actually take some steps uh, back in order for my mother to make a career. And, mm. um, and that was a natural step for him, I think. Uh, and such, uh, I believe that there was, equality was uh, embedded in, as a value in, in the, in the um, upbringing mm. of me and my sisters. 
Very interesting. Particularly these days when you think about equality, gender equality and more. Mm. I, d I don't know if you watched the movie Barbie over the summertime. <laughs> no, I haven't. Equality. Okay. <laughs> I'm not so there yet. Uh, so, I, so, so I will not tease you on Barbie. <laughs> okay. But I, so, I, I, my family members have, and they were deeply impressed by it. So, mm. Okay. Uh, so uh, just continuing on our discussion, yes, I've, I've had a number of wonderful guests on the podcast, including successful CEOs who, who share with us um, you know, some unique moments in their lives, in a way, change them forever. Uh, a couple of examples I had. Doug Conant, uh, the former CEO of Campbell's Soup in the U.S. He was fired when he was actually 32. And mm -hmm. as a result, started to consider what was holding him back from realizing his full potential. So he was really uh, on the wrong start. He was, uh, yet he ended as a CEO. Uh, another leader I'm sure you know well, former Unilever CEO Paul Pullman, right? Hmm. He, he, had, he, had a, he shared with us on the podcast this crucible moment in 2008 when he was caught up in a terrorist attack at the Taj Mahal Hotel in Mumbai. Wow. An okay. experience which made him realize the profound link between poverty and violence and changed hmm. his life as well. And last but not least, a uh, very, very uh, exciting leader, Bozoma St. John's. Uh, you know, used to be, uh, uh, again, uh, both uh, Netflix and, 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 and Apple as well. She lost her husband, Peter, uh, from cancer. And, and based on that uh, deeply, uh, I would say, of course, um, uh, involving experience uh, in her life, she's made a big decision. Actually, she, she, she actually even wrote a book on that, to live her life urgently. So I gave mm. you those examples, but I'm sure you, you'd like to share one defining moment <laughs> in your mm. life, Jesper, that had a profound impact on the leader you've become today. Okay. I know it's personal. I, I think, no, but it's fine. Uh, I think it's very good. We, we are personal also because that, as you said, that the, there are these defining moments. The, the thing that pops to mind instantly for me yeah. So I, I had my first my first international assignment was with IKEA. I applied yeah. for the job as a country manager for the trading uh, setup and structure in Pakistan. I heard and, that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I got the job. I was 25 years old. Yes. Um, and funny enough, which is a story in itself, I after a year I asked my manager who came from a visit on Singapore, "How come you take a 25 year old, <laughs> no IKEA experience, no experience <laughs> in Pakistan, yeah. and and offer this opportunity?" And then he told me I was the only one who applied for the job. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think sometimes we think we're special, uh, don't we? But uh, moving to Pakistan was a defining uh, yeah. mo mm. moment in my career, I mm. riddled by conflicts those days. Uh, mm. uh, there were basically, from a security perspective, it was a yeah. uh, partly dangerous place. Um, at the heart of, of uh, society, there was a number of industrialists Mm -hmm. uh, that I would say had an incredibly modern view on people and business. Um, yeah. And we, we built the business together, which I've, of course was uh, the reason I was there. Mm -hmm. uh, but what, what became a struggle for me uh, mm. personally was to see some of the values or the principles or the, even the yeah. structures in society was not there when it comes uh, to both mm. the people and planetary um, yes. uh, aspects. And I, I remember having a bit of a, a personal crisis also on, uh, hmm. on one hand, wanting to perform, wanting to show myself um, as a leader. Um, yeah. uh, at the same time, seeing things and experiencing things that were difficult to, uh, to digest, hmm. which then um, became not only for me, but um, these were the times I think when IKEA woke up to yeah. a responsibility as, hmm. as um, with a question to say, do we apply our values only on our in-house or does that apply for the end-to-end, end, uh, yes. so to say. And yeah. luckily we took the decision to go that route. Hmm. And the defining thing for me was, I thought at that, that moment that would mean sacrifice in business or whatnot. But so my, my journey throughout IKEA hmm. has been to actually uh, be part of proving that it is good business to be a good business. So that w happened in Pakistan, uh, which was, you it, know, yeah. uh, incredibly strong from both environmental and people side. Uh, and as we develop the business, which is still doing great, by the way. Yeah, it's a, it's a very, uh, very interesting story. And was there in particular any personal or corporate value that you felt was most at risk and that you are tested, right? As a young leader in Pakistan, leading uh, IKEA there and say, well, should I be firm on that value? Or maybe mm. not because the societal 
construct construct that you, you just discussed, which is very different mm, in Sweden mm. for sure. Any any particular? I think so. Yeah, I think the uh, Jean Philippe, the, there yeah. was uh, e even in the vision of IKEA. We, we then, as you um, shared, so we have a vision of creating a better everyday life for the many people. So we're about yes. better life. Yeah. And uh, the conflict for me was. How can we create better life for consumers mm. and not for people in the value chain? How could that not be? Yeah. Uh, how could that uh, contradiction be okay? Mm. And I guess at those days we then came to the conclusion, being also new in our expansions, these were new dilemmas for IKEA, not yeah. only for me, but we came to the conclusion it was not possible. There mm. would be a denial for all of us. So thereby uh, started the long journey for us on actually. How do you find a way to, to um, uh, not mm. only serve your consumers, but actually include everyone in your value chain, uh, which the... I think we do today from IKEA Foundation to supply chain to ourselves, our employees, our partners and mm. our customers. Thanks so much. And thanks so much for having raised your hand mm. to go to Pakistan, because I know in many large global corporates, not many people still today will raise their hands to go to Pakistan or equivalents of Pakistan these days. I think it was a, a wise, while actually courageous decision you took at well, the time. I, I, got, I got the advice uh, from yes. a couple of people, but my cousin ah. used to be yeah. into to early into China, into trading, and, and uh, mm. he also said, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you take the risk and take the chance, uh, yeah. There's, but you know, the the loss is very little, but the gain, if you if you make it in, in Pakistan, uh, you enormous. have an opportunity to make a name for yourself within the company. And I think he was right, after all. Right. That's a wonderful advice. So actually, early in your career as well, I think, Jesper, you benefited from uh, some great advice from a mentor, uh, which was mm. to learn as much as you can and take every party to educate yourself and participate to the, uh, the fullest in all work activities. And perhaps more importantly, to avoid following the shimmering objectives of a title. <laughs> so can you tell can you tell <laughs> us about that advice of not being obsessed by title or position and how it influenced mm. you back then and hopefully continues to influence you today, although mm. you are at the very top now of the company today. So <laughs> No, but I still remember when you when you mentioned it, I still remember and I think a lot of young leaders yeah. Maybe uh, who have the opportunity to listen to this would would agree to a certain stress of what 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 I'm going what is this going to lead to what is my next step and so on. Yeah, and I I had lots of that anxiety and starting in Pakistan I, it was important for me not to be forgotten uh, so mm. to say in any ways, but the advice I got was really to focus on the opportunity that you have at hand and it's it seems like a basic and simple advice, but it gave me calm and it yeah. gave me focus. Yeah, and. Ever since I have uh, decided with myself that I don't all the thoughts about what's going to happen next, mm. I simply push them away. Um, mm. And that helps me not only focus, but it helps me be happy what I do. Yes. But it also helps me to avoid, which I've done a couple of times, yeah. um, opportunities of promotion or other job opportunities, which would maybe be smart from a career planning perspective. Um, mm. And I, I tried to avoid that and look at how can I develop myself. Yes. Um, and in the maybe best advice I ever got was from my mother, actually, when I was young. Ah, and that was okay. as simple as to say, if you find something where, where you're, uh, she said, yes, but if you find something where you're uh, good at and that also makes you happy, then that's a good place to be. <laughs> I know sometimes we might be good at things, but it doesn't really make us happy. <laughs> I have a lot of things I'm not good at. <laughs> so, uh, you know, but the combination of yeah. the two, uh, I think, leads to something more than a career, right? I more than agree with you. We'll, we'll come back to that later on in terms of what are the things you are the most good at or give you the most pleasure at in your mm -hmm. life, okay, overall, later on. But let's, let's go back now, not just to you, but to your company's history, which is pretty amazing. Uh, my understanding, it was, uh, IKEA was founded in 1943 in Almult, Sweden, by Ingvar Kamprad, mm. uh, the, the IK, I mean, the famous IK in IKEA. <laughs> yes. when, I host, when I hosted Paul Polman on a podcast, he told us as well about the story of Unilever's inception at the end of the 19th century in Britain to address the issues of hygiene in society. And mm. how, as he became the CEO, you know, he took the founder's core values and translated that uh, into the needs of today to reconnect the entire company and leadership team with Unilever's roots and social mission. So as the incoming CEO, when you took your role as CEO, did you find it important to refresh your team and employees' memory mm. on IKEA's history 
and to tell the story of Ingvar Kamprad. Very good. Now, both I would say both and. So, yeah, uh, Ingvar was uh, an incredible profile and entrepreneur. And interesting enough, I just came back from an uh, excellent trip to China, the first one in four years, m- meeting some ministers. Yes, who met him back in 2007 and made a lovely impression. So he still <laughs> seems to help us. Uh, so he he was a, a visionary. He was a business entrepreneur. He was not necessarily so interested in strategy or administration or structure. So vision vision. and then hands-on was his uh, style. And over the years, I think he he grew, as the company became successful, he grew an interest and passion in how do we actually contribute to to the goodness of this world. Hmm. So uh, actually, the early 80s, he gave away the group to set up a structure of a foundation, which still is the sole owner of uh, the company. So there's zero uh, euro that leaves our system. To Either it's reinvested into the company or it's given to charitable purposes, which is, which mm. is quite beautiful. It is. So, so you know, uh, t- to a certain extent, the values mm. that he represented, I believe, are timeless. Mm. The, the values of uh, togetherness, the v- values of leading yes. through setting good examples, um, the idea of actually having a purpose, serving mm. humanity rather than just uh, earning money. So all of these are good. At the same time, I like mm-hmm. to believe there is. Um, it's important not to strike a balance, but to strike a dynamic relation yes. between loving the past and creating the future. Of course. And there is, of course, a risk in a strong concept uh, company like IKEA that we become arrogant, or we become afraid of accepting mm. the mm. the challenges of change or uh, yeah. changing society. So when I when I started this assignment, I realized uh, through. Mm. Customers and yep. coworkers that, uh, painfully enough, that we had been maybe leaning too much towards our past uh, uh-huh. successes. So Imagine we were a little bit also in, mm. yeah. in line of uh, your business, uh, Jean Philippe. Um, yeah. We were we were very analog. Uh, yeah. We had yeah. uh, pushed to the future everything yeah. digital, not everything, but l- a lot, mm. and we hadn't really taken a deep thought about the business operating mm. model for the future. Yeah. So I think, you know, love the past, but you need to stay very open and alert to what's happening that uh, places mm. you into the, the future. Like you refer to Paul Polman, he did so elegantly to yes. translate it into the next model, so to say. No, I, I, I love that uh, statement you made, actually. It's very similar in a way to what Satya said in Adela, I mean, you know, my manager mm. and CEO, of course, Microsoft has said once, said, you know, honor your past, your traditions, but lead with innovation to shape the future. I mean, it's, mm. uh, it's like you need to balance both, actually. Yeah, <laughs> you need to. And I think the, in, the interesting thing is that if you put them up against each other, the, mm. the past is concrete, it's clear, it's defined. Yeah. The future is not. So the free yeah. future is more fragile. Yeah. Ideas are more fragile. Um, and therefore, I think one of the values that our founder always uh, kept central was the uh, the right uh, and the obligation to, to make mistakes yeah. and the drive for entrepreneurship. And still, I, I have uh, many moments when I'm, that makes me a bit concerned as a big company, a mm. big group, that we are uh, rejecting the new uh, uh-huh. a little bit too much. So there yeah. are many ways we try to go about that. My most desperate moment, I've issued yep. what I call Go Bananas cards, which I'm handing out. Go Bananas, uh, okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's, a, it? it's an idea. So basically yeah. the card gives you a license. It looks like a driver's uh, license, but it gives okay. you an encouragement to make mistakes. Hmm. And if you make a mistake and you have to apologize, I have already co-signed the, the excuse uh, <laughs> uh, there. So you have a friend uh, in me if you then uh, do, do something that didn't really work out well. This is just one of the ways no, we try to make it a bit playful as well, but to say interesting. IKEA no, it wasn't just yeah. there. It yeah. was developed through entrepreneurs, risk takers, yes. and probably nine out of ten experiments didn't work out as we thought, yeah. but it led to the IKEA that we see today. So we need to continue that spirit. No, I love those bananas uh, cards. <laughs> uh, just continue on the same kind of a discussion thread, uh, Jesper. Uh, I understand when you became CEO uh, back in 2017, you took a trip around the world, hmm. meeting with all your c- colleagues, co-workers, for management to really uh, frontline shop uh, floor workers to listen, listen mm. to their opinions, their feelings. It reminded me actually of a discussion I had with Hubert Jolie, you know, who used to be the, the CEO of Best Buy in the US, and Hubert Jolie, when he became the CEO of Best Buy, mm. uh, he, he did a, a very extensive tour of all the stores in the US, on the ground, and, mm. and really trying to unleash 
uh, mm. the values, the fears, the hopes, the excitement, and indeed, uh, what could be the mission of the mm. company that he was trying to actually uh, to reset? Because at the time, uh, in this, in that case, Best Buy was actually in pretty bad shape, so he had to do a, okay. a mm. major intervention. Anyway, in your case, how was it important for you mm. to? to gain a deeper understanding of, because you've been in IKEA for many mm. years, so you've been growing within the company. So you, say, mm -hmm, you could mm -hmm. say, well, what do you need to do that? What did you learn? What have you done anything differently as a starting CEO because of that? Yeah. So I think now it was very interesting. So in spite of having had many years in, in IKEA yeah. previous to taking this assignment, I had not, so I'm grown up in the supply chain, if you like, in the, yeah. and then I've been working predominantly into the business development, design, product development, and so forth. Uh, so I, I, I'm not sprung out of the customer mm. side uh, uh, naturally. Yeah. So I felt it was number one for me was to show respect for colleagues to to engage and deeply try to understand the uh, the benefits and the challenges of uh, our daily operations, basically. Yeah. And I thought it was a way, of course, also to introduce myself to uh, to make myself available for people. So. People. It was uh, art by accident. We, we set it up to be very on. There were mm -hmm. no PowerPoints, no conference rooms. <laughs> uh, okay. We had uh, we were in reality with our co colleagues, co-workers yeah. in stores, in, in distribution and whatnot. But we also made an honor as we traveled through ooh, Poland, Spain, France, mm. UK, Canada, US, Japan, China, Russia. Wow. Uh, Sweden. These were the markets. Yeah. Uh, a month it took. So we made a, a, an honor to meet customers also in their homes. Um, hmm. And the interesting thing uh, was there was a lot of confirmation, uh, which you of course like to hear of the positives. But there were a couple of deep concerns and mm. worries that was brought. Mm. And it was actually brought up very often as here in Poland, it's special, here in Canada, uh -huh. it's special. But yeah. it was the same thing. And mm. as, you, as you might not be surprised to hear, one of the aspects was that we were accessible in the classic IKEA way, full day out, everything instant gratification, so forth. Yes. But we were not really uh, accessible digitally and service wise. Uh -huh. yeah. And yeah. customer after customer, country after country was saying that. We have started to deselect you because you're not there because of that, in the yeah. way. Yeah. yeah. So in a way, you can say two things happened. The customers mm. and our coworkers were giving me a brief. Yeah. So <laughs> by listening to them, yeah. not m make the strategy mysterious, but actually just yeah. listening to the loudest voices or the repetition of voices, it was all there. So when I came home, I, I shared with my management group uh, a travel report. And one mm. of my colleagues said, that's the new strategy. And I said, no, it's a travel report. And then <laughs> he said, no, no, it's the new strategy. It we is. said, yeah, it is the new strategy. So the current strategy of IKEA, uh, in that sense, is actually a travel report. Yeah. And I found it, uh, you talked about initially here about life-changing moments. And even yeah. if this is not dramatic in that sense, for me, I will never go back to making an intellectual yeah. exercise with few people. Yeah. engage uh, and the truths are out there and i think by having really big ears you will be able to to, to grasp your uh, strategy in a better way no i love it you know and uh, and and you know all along my career i've been someone really uh, connected to the ground to the field traveling mm. to 100 countries plus for microsoft and and i would say this is the only way of in in a way defined strategies just by taking the pulse in mm. all those countries exactly as you describe from customers and your people mm. and your employees as well because i think that gives you so much actually uh, obvious insights into mm. the reality of the business as opposed sometimes to some headquarters view we all have mm. <laughs> for meeting between each other anyway for wonderful uh, I, I must yeah. say also that the, one yeah. of the benefits of it is because when you try to lead change of course there will be resistance uh, yeah. in the system uh, as always but there is something when you have the voice of your customer so clear Mm. And uh, that in that way, that is your best tool, I think, to drive the change. Coming back to love the past, create the future. Yeah, love it, love it. I mean, the voice customers is always uh, truth, actually. So, mm. so there have been some very significant challenges that uh, I know you faced as a CEO from the global pandemic through to well in Europe, of course, till today, unfortunately. And you've expressed before mm. that it's been a very humbling experience for you, right? So can you talk about what you found most challenging and how you've managed to steal the company through those crises, and not only to survive, actually to thrive. And, and to finish mm. with, I would say, how much it has changed your approach to what is called usually crisis management, right? When you've got mm -hmm. a big challenge happening somewhere in the world globally, 
uh, in the way you actually do your role as a CEO today, Jesper? Mm. So th these uh, last years have been so challenging, I think, for the world, for all of us, and definitely for myself uh, as well mm -hmm. in this role. Uh, I still vividly recall the first week of the pandemic. Um, yeah. uh, you know, we all go through the cycle of change. First it's in denial, then it's an yeah. irritation, and then the true grasping of the seriousness of the situation and how it was disrupting yeah. all the plans and the, uh, and the model of IKEA, if, uh, if you like. So I'm not typically a person that uh, have difficulty sleeping, but I can tell you there were a couple of days and weeks um, in mm. the early phase of the pandemic where the predictions having at a moment, I think we had out of 450 stores, only 20 were open. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah. And, and we were predicting massive red. And if you, with yeah. no exaggeration, we, we were yeah. seeing a scenario of layoffs and closures and basically hmm. uh, a threat to, to IKEA's existence. Yeah. So the interesting learning, I think, is maybe one is this speed of accepting change, right? If you're good hmm. at that and uh, if, you, yeah. if you have the motto of, uh, of course, hoping for the best, but expecting the worst. Yeah. Um, and then I think what, what was so cool with the IKEA uh, network was that we, we realized we don't have a map for the situation. There is nothing mm. in, uh, in the drawer to help us, but we have a good compass uh, mm. with our values. Yeah. So we basically took the decision with all our leaders to say, do what's right. Mm. Um, there was, we, we were basically dictating to say that the plans, the two years, two and a half years plans we had for online, we yeah. said <laughs> to the organization, <laughs> it would be nice if you could do it in six weeks. <laughs> six weeks, wow. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, and of course, yeah. and the cool thing was we, we were actually capable in most places to do that. So wow. at that time, actually, IKEA didn't have online. We had one or two markers experimenting, but yeah. digital, uh, uh, everybody, I mean, the top managers were out in our, with the masks on and packing goods in our stores. We converted yeah. all our stores into fulfillment centers. Yeah. And luckily, since we had listened to our customers two years earlier, mm. we actually had started the service mm. setups and the online capabilities digitally. Otherwise, we would have been in deep problems. Mm. So basically, unions, everybody was there to say, now we actually roll up our sleeves and we, make, we save the company together. Huh. So I think six, eight weeks later, we were actually in a, I give you one example in a yeah. very interesting moment because in the early uh, stages, we were actually, as furlough was, uh, was proposed yeah. from many governors, we were yeah. uh, signing up for that. Eight weeks later, we, we said, no, but we're going to make it. We're going to be in, <laughs> we're going to be, not make a lot, lot profit, but we're going to be in the black. Because and we actually the... had a moral discussion to say it's wrong for wow. us that give yeah. the furlough to somebody else. So we actually reversed furlough in all markets. Uh, That's amazing. And, and thank the government and said, thank, we, we actually don't need this. Yeah. And the funny thing, in many legislations, it n has ne never happened before. <laughs> so, no, no, so it no. was a new experiment. So <laughs> no, but that mean, was a humbling moment, I must say. I'm sure. I mean, uh, amazing, amazing uh, experiences. I mean, in two different ways. Well, you said first, it's about empowering your people and mm. having confidence in their decisions uh, during the pandemic, saying, you guys know what's going on in Poland or Mexico or Sweden or France. You take the decision, take care of the people and customers and so on. And number two, you probably made a switch uh, and clearly uh, to e-commerce strategically that may not have ever happened. I mean, I no, don't know, right? So I interesting. I think it would have taken have, many more said. years. So yeah. Yeah. in a way, with all the respect of the human suffering of, of, uh, of the pandemic and the crisis, the pandemic helped IKEA to become omnichannel in more than double speed. Hmm. And, and you can say today we are, you know, we are yep. doing about a quarter of the, the business online. Um, it's, I wouldn't say it starts to flatten out like that, but you can, you can yep. also say in metropolis areas, we're up to 50%, but we not only have it yeah. uh, in place with services and, and distribution, we found the IKEA hmm. model in, in doing it in an effective way. So it's scalable, actually. Yep. Yep. So our fear was that it would be economically uh, challenging, but we have found a way to make it actually not only helping our top line, but actually drive economics through the, the company. And absolutely, the pandemic was the catalyst because it became a survival factor for us. No, uh, very, very, very interesting and insightful, actually, crisis opportunity. <laughs> mm. uh, you know, uh, I'd like to shift gears now, uh, Jesper, and talk about some of the other developments you made with IKEA. Uh, as we record this episode, we've been experiencing in Europe, in many parts of the world, 
one of the very warmest summers and mm. years ever. And as a company, you've set some very ambitious targets around sustainability, and you've said in different instances that this is your top priority. I was interested to read the introduction you wrote for the business of building a better world, the leadership revolution that is changing everything, where you talk about this decade being mm. crunch time for companies and governments. Mm. And as a reminder for our listeners, IKEA's vision is to create a better everyday life for, for the many people. And you want to inspire and enable 1 billion people <laughs> to live healthier and more sustainable lives within the limits of the planet by 2030, which is mm. a very exciting vision. So now, from vision to reality, Jesper, can you tell me about not just, of course, the targets you've set for the company, but could you share with us the three most challenging and controversial decisions mm. you had to make at the CEO mm -hmm. uh, on how to help to make real progress towards IKEA becoming a net zero company? So beyond the, the statements, what have you done and what have you found super hard to do to make Very it happen? Good. Yeah. No, but I think, I think the, the growing insight to start there also, why is this important for us? Uh, you can say uh, there are three things. Uh, to start with, of course, from an ethical perspective, yeah. knowing what we know today. And I, we all regret that back uh, 30 years ago, we had absolutely no understanding or even mm. 20 years ago, no, no real uh, conception of yeah. the damage that we are causing to the planet and ourselves. Um, so uh, that is, of course, uh, gave us a very late start to everything. That's why this decade, this is it. This is the biggest existentialistic moment for humanity to, to get this right. Yeah. So from a moral perspective, no, we cannot hand this over to the next generation, it's now. Secondly, it's super interesting. I think a lot of brands out there are doing a big mistake. So if I look at IKEA's customer mm. base, uh, we have recently done the updated study of interviewing 33,000 people in 30 markets. Yep. And the, the, the awareness of climate change and the worry is yes. way now above 70. There is no place below 70. It's wow. very consistent from US to China to uh, Germany and so forth. Um, if you go down in generations, yeah. it, it increases. And yeah. as such, it's very clear that our, our uh, customers expect us to be a leader. Yeah. That's going to increase. And, and I think people will start deselecting brands or not uh, doing whatever they can. It doesn't sure. have to be perfect, but you need no. to have the intent. Yes. Uh, the third and interesting aspect that people mm. misunderstand o over and over again is that mm. uh, this should come at a premium. It's very clear from our customers to say, yeah. Yeah. we expect you to fix this. We don't have the money to, to pay extra for this. So you need to find a way to, to do it. So we have accepted that. Uh -huh. uh, but then again, being climate smart means being resource smart means being cost smart. Yes. So obviously there are areas and yeah. decisions to be taken. There are shifts in legislation that needs to happen and so forth. But yeah. our general mindset is that climate smart is going to help us make IKEA yeah. economically much better in the future. Huh. Not only in the future, we see the evidence all around us right now. Yes. Uh, so I, I think the one of the difficult decisions is maybe about belief. Mm. So, th because they, they typically CEOs and companies want yeah. to have a plan before you commit to something. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case, I think IKEA, who is known for, for wanting that, have actually been braving saying that even if we don't have all the details right, we'll make uh, it we don't have the time not to commit. So we need to believe mm. in that we can get this right. Um, and I, I do believe uh, there has been difficult decisions to, yeah, give me one. to commit give me, wi without give me. having all the answers. Give, give me one of such decisions you made that you could share, obviously, with our listeners that has been not easy to take with yeah. your employees and yeah. people. Yeah? yeah, No, but I think I think I can give you many. Yeah. They are not, you, you can say they are just interesting because I think a lot of people would yeah. recognize themselves. We decided a few years ago to, uh, to cancel our total uh, light source business, uh, mm. in the incandescent uh, lighting bulbs and so yes. forth. Yes. It's big, big uh, business, big, big margin, business. Hmm. Uh, and we decided it, it must be wrong stop with it. the knowledge we had of uh, climate change and whatnot. So we went for LED, hmm. and at that time, the prices of LED were, I think, 20-fold compared hmm. to today. Wow. So we took that bet, hoping that we would be able to scale up yeah. and make a good business case, which we were capable to do. We're looking at the business uh, today, that was absolutely a brilliant decision. Uh, Hmm. But at the moment, it felt like uh, almost yeah. careless. 
yeah. uh, from yeah. a business perspective. And we were criticized for, for that decision uh, internally. It turned yeah. out to be the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, I've had similar when we developed the code of conduct, which actually leads back to the days of Pakistan and um, hmm. the, the years shortly after we we, we, we developed a code of conduct in IKEA with about 80 questions on, on both yep. sustainability from a people and planet point of view. Mm -hmm. There was a deep uh, worry that we would become more expensive. Hmm. Interesting enough, motivation grow, productivity quality. There were so many effects yeah. that actually helped us do the opposite to take out cost uh, from the value chain. So I would say my experience and my advice to people is if if it is the right thing, the thing that wants to happen, yeah. um, you, you have to trust that the economic sense will be there. Yeah. And I do believe in all of these hesitation that happens in so many places currently and waiting with investments and so forth. Yeah. This is a game of too early, too early, too late. Oh, too late. Yeah. And you need yeah. to pick the, the right too early. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you don't want to yeah. be in the too late era. Yeah. And that means you need to take some personal risk as a leader as well, yeah. of course. No, it's a, it's a wonderful uh, reinforcement of uh, indeed uh, risk taking uh, these days. When you when when you think about uh, this uh, sustainability commitment many companies are taking, probably mm. they all need to take more risk. Actually, starting at the very top. So, continuing to build on that, yes, Bill, There's obviously a growing emphasis now across the world of measuring impact and measuring what is called no ESG with the mm. CSRD coming in Europe by. 25, where all the companies will report. You know, in a, in, a, in a previous podcast episode, I talked to Sir Ronald Cohen, uh, who is a prominent advocate for impact investments. And he has highlighted the need for a shift towards impact investing and the importance of accurately measuring impact indeed. And you've talked about the economic benefits you're seeing from the choice you've made. You just gave an example, very interesting in terms of uh, basically uh, the lead as an example. Uh, and you made many other choices to reduce your carbon footprint. Hmm. So how do you see the role of measuring impact Very good. Uh, evolving in the corporate world, uh, starting with IKEA in your company? And do, do you balance that, of course, <laughs> with yeah. your profitability promise to your shareholders, right? Because yeah, you've got yeah. to do both. It's not one and maybe the others. <laughs> no, but I think, yeah, and I'm, I'm deeply convinced that the profitability will come by being on the right side of the economic transition. And by the way, also the right yeah. side of humanity. But you can mm. say that the, um, this is a definitely a topic that needs fact-based approach. Yes. So you, you can say the starting point and my encouragement to all companies, if you don't yet have that in place, is to make your what the technical term of scope three uh, analysis of your of your footprint, carbon footprint. So that would then in an IKEA, it's quite quite easy to understand in a way. You can say scope three is like everything. So <laughs> in the IKEA point of view, the upstream would be raw material production. Yeah. Yep. transportation, you have yep. retailing, yep. you have customer transportation, and you have uh, uh, use in life at home, and finally afterlife. So there are seven, seven uh, silos, if you like. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then you need to know what is the carbon impact, so you don't act blindly on what you, your yeah. gut tells you. For instance, a lot of people, including myself, thought that transport would be, be the biggest contributor for carbon, which is not. It's not the case. Uh, so in our, our case, uh, it's actually 50% yeah. raw material is the big yeah. uh, aspect. One reason it's 50% is because also we have been faster in addressing some of the other ones. Yes. So, so what you need to do, you need to have the fact-based approach. You need to yeah. target yeah. the yeah. different uh, areas with different solutions. Um, and then, interesting enough, you know, mm -hmm. uh, ripe the economic benefits of such yes. as well. Yeah. And then I would say there is certain aspects which I think more and more people are also awakening to that these different uh, aspects are connected. So circularity connects all of them. Yeah. If you crack circularity, you can actually get benefits in more of these uh, dimensions. So definitely, uh, as, the, yeah. as the world to your question is, is speeding up legislation, uh, we uh, working together in World Economic Forum's Climate yes. Alliance, Yep. We advocate for simplicity and uh, alignment, of course. Alignment, yes. Th this is an area that invites to technicality, technocracy, bureaucracy, and it's an Complexity. area where yeah. there mm. can be, in the worst mm. case, that companies need to have different reporting regimes, yeah. um, while everybody's, uh, at the essence, trying to strive for the same thing. So yeah. we welcome the reporting, we welcome uh, the transparency, but we also want uh, a bit more 
collaboration to simplify and align across borders. Across borders and and across legislation as well. I like, mm. I like to come back to one point you made, which I think is, is one of the, the, the big bets you are doing uh, underpinning your sustainability commitment. Building a full circular economic model and 100% of your products circular by 2030. I think that's one of your strategy goals. So what does it actually mean to, to share with our listeners who are not necessarily experts in circularity, Esper? And can you give mm -hmm. us a concrete example of one of circular products that mm -hmm. uh, your consumers buy from IKEA today? And how do you plan then to systematize that circularity model Very good. to everything you produce, you sell, and then you service after uh, the products are being used by the customers? Uh, it's hard work. It's, to some extent, it's a total transformation of um, yeah. of the economy, if you like. Um, uh, but if I, if I start at the end, it's an, in it's an interesting area because it's riddled by myths. One of the myths is that we should uh, stop consuming, if you say, or the, the aspect of co that consumption is, uh, is bad, which it is. Uh, so the interesting thing is, from a climate science point of view, or fact-based point of view, yes. Um, one of the mitigations is, of course, reducing unnecessary consumption, yeah. prolonging life, supporting second-hand. All these tactics, if you like, are part of our climate plan. Yes. But at the essence, in a growing world population, I you have to address the core consumption. If you, if you think about the, the simplicity of, by 2050, we need to be at net zero. Yeah. So does that mean we would have consumption by 2030 and then have zero consumption by 2050? No, of course not. That yeah. would be the end of humanity. We can't eat, sleep, etc. So we, we, cannot, um, we cannot abandon the core of consumption itself. And if I give you I have several great examples from yeah. uh, vegetables to whatnot, but one of the coolest is we have recently, the last uh, four or five years, as in a collaboration with the Dutch government, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, address taking back mattresses. mattresses so mattresses I mean. might be 8% of our sales or something, but maybe doubling climate footprint is quite bulky mm. and material intense. Yes. Uh, now, the interesting thing is we, it was difficult for us to find economy in bringing back these products and make new because yeah. the system didn't allow for it. So what happened was that the Dutch government went in to stop uh, subsidizing incineration of mattresses. Huh. And then imposed a law to say yeah. that you have to drop your old mattress on a collection point. Hmm. Now imagine uh, 17 million people. In average, a mattress is uh, 10 years. So 1.7 million mattresses year. per year goes wow. to incineration. In the Netherlands. Now we, we set up yeah. a system. Yeah. And today we expanded it to four uh, units. We have a capacity to take back every mattress in the Netherlands. Not only our share. Wow. And here comes the good news. It's yeah. good business. So uh, it, wow. when okay. we break up the polyester, <laughs> the foam, the metal, yes. we sell it back into the supply chain to make new products. It's actually, huh. it's not the best business I've ever seen, but it's actually making a lot of uh, business sense. Yeah. And thereby, you not only minimize, you're not prolonging the life of mattresses only or minimizing unnecessary. Yes. And by yeah. the way, very few people buy a mattress on a spontaneous level, right? It's a necessity yeah. driven yeah. purchase. Yeah. So now we are capable through plugging in EV transport in the logistics side to actually create yeah. a consumption uh, solution for mattresses that is climate neutral, yeah. which is amazing. So when people say this is a vision or an idea, but it's not uh, realistic, here you have one of the uh, uh, cases. And if I may, Jean-Philippe, because I yes. think this is important, yeah. um, people have hard to believe that it's possible to, you have to sacrifice growth for yeah. uh, car decoupling carbon. So IKEA since the mm. 2016 yeah. report a sales increase of 24.8%. Mm -hmm. So wow. we, we go since then, we report a decoupling of carbon of absolute minus 136 Wow. So it's not relative, it's absolute. So In absolute, yeah. that's one example to say it seems yeah. to be a good idea to grow and decouple carbon. Uh, um, so basically we are currently updating our goals because we're almost at the regional uh, 2030 goal. Yes. Uh, we also need to update that because of new insights in science and so forth. But yeah. it gives me hope that decoupling carbon yeah. is, is a good business idea, actually. Well, wonderful, uh, wonderful example you, you took and you, you share with all of us, Jesper, of circularity. And, uh, and I'm sure you're busy doing that on every products and changing the mix of your materials as well to, to, to again, uh, get to that net zero uh, IKEA 
even sooner than later. I mean, it looks like you've got a plan, actually. <laughs> we uh, do, and it's it's yeah. humbling. In some areas, it's easier. Some, it's we still struggle. Super still, we, we're looking yeah. for the answers. Uh, yeah. As you said, it might even so. be that we need to abandon some materials and find yeah. new solutions. So some of it is not easy, but uh, we definitely the 50% target 2030, which is the one that we spend most time on, on right now. Yes. Uh, it seems to be in, in our reach. Yeah. So one of the ways, uh, Jesper, to, to get inspiration, but also to get some real solution, I found myself, and within Microsoft and outside Microsoft with my different roles, is to partner with change makers, social entrepreneurs, mm. what is being called these days impact entrepreneurs around the world. There are a number of wonderful companies whose uh, North Star is all about having a positive impact in the world. So your company has a long tradition, and actually we are partnering together with the WEF, uh, with the Schwab Foundation, with this World Economic Forum Alliance for Social Entrepreneurship, to ensure that big enterprise can not only get inspiration, but actually can procure product services from such entrepreneurs. So can you tell us more about how IKEA has been involved and is involved with social entrepreneurs, impact entrepreneurs around the world, both in terms of strategy, but also hands on experimentation products and what do you expect from that in the future? Mm. Well, there are different exciting uh, opportunities. I think one of the starting points for us to address social entrepreneurs, we had the opportunity to invite the now late Professor Hans uh, Rosling, who mm. was, I think, the mastermind of understanding long term demographic changes and an optimist uh, yes. uh, of rank. Um, he came to us and he, he took a vision of serving the many people and he pointed at the gap. He said, you have, you have on one hand, you have your customers, you have yourself, your suppliers, then you have nothing, and then you have IKEA Foundation, who basically do <laughs> uh, philanthropic work for the, the people yes. who have the least, maybe. Yeah. But he, he pointed us in a direction to say, there are so many people who, the barrier to be a, a big supplier to you is just too big. Mm. So we started a social entrepreneurship in, in uh, two ways. Yeah. One, would, one was actually in the close to our uh, retailing where we work for instance we maybe there can be an entrepreneur who w works with stitching or giving services to ikea uh, yep. uh, products they could be circularity second hand and so forth um, and the second was basically to look into offer job opportunities for people yep. at, uh, through uh, creating products uh, sometimes more handicraft related uh, yeah the, the point was though to see that other people have an opportunity to build something from the ground which is basically a program that we also applied yeah. uh, together with the IKEA Foundation's uh, uh, direction. We actually did, for instance, set up mm. such an uh, entrepreneurship in Jordan. It was mm. one of my uh, well, uh, favorite projects to actually yes. offer uh, job opportunities to refugees from Syria from the crisis. Um, so in a way, you can say it serves our social mission quite well. Yeah. Um, it gives us an opportunity to learn then you have the total other end, of course, where we are investing into new technologies. We recently, yeah. I think yesterday, announced a collaboration with H2 Steel hmm. to basically now introduce um, green steel in all our properties and real estate. So wow. they, that's not a social entrepreneur, but it's an entrepreneur who starts from very little and has yeah. a vision about the new economy, which we like to support. Uh, and I think we need both, actually. We need both mm. the inspiration of social entrepreneurs and also from... Uh, I would say innovation-led uh, companies. I'd like to finish a couple of questions because time is going very mm. fast, yes, but, uh, on leadership, going back to the leadership discussion we had early in your days. In an article you co-wrote for Fortune a couple of years ago, you said that we need to scrap the old leadership model and mm. replace it with one that places humanity, humility, and brave action at the heart of everything we do, which is something I totally agree with. Indeed, I recently had Stephen M. R. Covey on a podcast to talk about his latest research on leadership, mm. a new model that he's explored and written about in his book, Trust and Inspire. Mm. And your leadership style is very resonant of the ideas he proposes. What he said is, in Trust and Inspire, uh, it's about a new way of leading that starts with the belief that people are creative, collaborative, and full of potential. People with this kind of leader are inspired to become the best version of themselves and to produce their best work People don't want to be managed. People want to be led. Mm. So how do you see this new way of leadership developing? And what are the most important lessons leadership you've learned along the way to, uh, well, to become a role model in doing more mm -hmm. of that? Mm -hmm. Wow, it's a, it's, a, it's a big topic and an important one. I, I think if I start with the last question, I think one of the things personally that I've learned to 
uh, accept and maybe also change my own nature in a way. So I, I think to accept dilemmas and uh, yeah. I've been in my early uh, days, I've been far too light on uh, uh, seeking the fast track into inspiration and movement. But I think these days, I think when I when I run into some juicy dilemmas, yes. normally they are the best, you know, make them the best friend. Take your time to yeah. explore them, expand your horizon, because in, in, in true dilemmas li- leads uh, lies very often the, the great uh, opportunities to make an impact. But as to your introduction of your question, I do believe myself, I've come to a point in life where I think I find it inc- totally uninteresting to work for mm. making money or mm. making somebody rich or to to drive growth as, as the only uh, element. So I think the future belongs to, I hope and believe, to leaders, companies, organizations that has a purpose to serve humanity. Yes, and and it's I don't see uh, the contradiction between uh, the business opportunity and doing good. I think that is the that is the uh, uh, new corporate environment that that uh, uh, we will look for. Of course, you can say uh, when you talked about Unilever, it started with a beautiful idea. Yeah. I, Microsoft started with a beautiful idea to serve humanity. Of course, there is always an entrepreneur and a yeah. spirit, but very soon there comes something more fundamental and deep. Um, within it. So I, I believe to a certain extent, uh, managing is maybe step one in leadership is about management and managing things or a team. Uh, mm-hmm. Step two, maybe is leading transformations. Microsoft, like IKEA, have undergone mm-hmm. great yeah. transformation. You need to have believers, flag carriers, you need to yeah. instigate momentum, uh, not perfection. Uh, then I think level three for me, maybe it's also with the respect of our founder, as the deep insight of understanding that culture is even stronger. So uh-huh. if you can invest in culture, you yeah. will have resilience for the unexpected and tough times. Um, and right now I'm curiously experimenting what I think might be the next level. And I call it servant <laughs> leadership. I don't know if it's a term like that, but- Oh, it's been I existing. To a certain ex- a, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I, no, but I believe truly that yeah. if you take out your own ego, yeah. If you take on your and, and look at what is it actually that you can do and in the servant leadership thinking, it leads you also mm. to believe that the ultimate goal for you as a leader is that you're not needed anymore, if you see my point. So oh, how yeah. can you contribute okay. to to uh, change and building something? And yeah. when you're done, then basically the, it can continue without your energy and passion. Love so it. that's where yeah. I am right now in my leadership <laughs> development. M- much left to learn. <laughs> you are on what is called your second mountain of leadership, I think. Uh, okay. <laughs> so the, almost finishing, you know, uh, in our Positive Leadership Podcast, we often talk to leaders, all kind of leaders, actually, very different types of people, in the way they find resources in themselves to create a positive energy. And I'd like you to talk about the way you create your moments of calm in your day, the way you relax and unwind. <laughs> I understand you are a sailor, and I understand that I've been recently in the islands in Sweden, you need to be a good mm. sailor, but also you love music. As a matter of fact, you play guitar. I understand you play actually really well guitar. And you've said before that <laughs> playing guitar is your yoga, and you do it every day. So tell me about your guitar practice. Are you in a band? What kind of music do you play? And how does it help you create positive energy? <laughs> Not Very just good. within yourself, but with others, right? In your days, in your weeks, when you have some tough decisions to make. Mm. No, but thank you. I think, I think uh, it was beautifully uh, said. We, I think uh, it's um, it's an important quality to be able to be self generation uh, generating of positive energy. Yeah. And uh, for me, originally uh, introverted nature it means that I need time for myself. I need the time to focus. So, I think if I look at the hours I play guitar, yep. I'm absolutely hopeless. I should have been <laughs> much much better at this point. But <laughs> but the point point with uh, my interest in music and. Uh, yeah. Playing guitar is really the relaxation and the energy of it. So it can be beautiful, it can be smooth, it can be also, I, I, I like, uh, so I'm, I'm currently the lead singer in, a, in oh. a heavy metal band, the best heavy metal heavy band metal. in Hong Kong. Oh, wow. yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, we haven't met in a while, I have to admit, okay. uh, but uh, the, the band members are still there and we've, we've had a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> but I think, so I think, uh, yeah, I do believe it's important to find your source of yeah. recuperation and focus and again music for me works like meditation my mm. my wife is a yoga teacher and, and she mm. she helps me with meditation but yeah uh, music works like the best meditation because it totally mm. relaxes the mind and shifts 
yes. my focus uh, to focus something on. else. So, so I love I've loved that. That's my hobby, and that's my way of um, <laughs> of uh, getting a moment of recuperation. Uh, so definitely. I can feel and it. There's uh, a lot of people who share that, by the way. We had, a, <laughs> I tell you a funny story. We had, yeah. um, I think it was in May, the first pandemic year. Yeah. I've had a, 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 a tough week with a lot of tears mm. and people mm. being in isolation and whatnot. So yeah. at the end of the day, I was inspired by BBC who, who did a similar yeah. setup. And I actually, so I wrote a song and uh, huh. I recorded it at home. I had some friends at a studio who polished hmm. it. And we sent it to some 50 people in IKEA in all countries. Wow. So we have people singing, people playing drums, <laughs> people playing guitar, bass, and we actually managed to compile it. Uh, wow. And if you would, if, if you look for uh, uh, the IKEA band uh, and a song called "Rain on Java," Rain you will Java. see some 50 people in IKEA actually <laughs> performing a song in isolation during COVID. So I think music has the power to bring people together. That's a very inspiring story. Now, my really last question, because I know you're super busy, Jesper. You know, we are in 2023. So uh, what would be your coaching message, 2023, for young 25 years old Jesper, starting his professional career? Not necessarily in IKEA, in any place in the world, maybe in Sweden, maybe in Pakistan or somewhere else. What do you think are the most meaningful life lessons, leadership lessons you've had? Uh, to share back with this young Jesper to apply in his life in 2023 as he gets started. What would that be? Wow, what an <laughs> opportunity. So I have 25 advice now. No. I, I, to keep it short, you know, I think the advice I would give to myself yeah. uh, would be twofold, I think. Uh, don't worry so much, <laughs> I would tell myself. I yeah. think when I look back uh, over the years, I've worried too much about the future and so on. Uh, yeah. um, and I think, uh, as such, I think, um, uh, breathe the optimism within yourself uh, yes. and uh, it will guide you to the right places. Yeah. And I think then, finally, that's very uh, related to my mother's old advice to try yes. to look for the things you're good at. If you don't find it, keep trying. Yes. Uh, and then find the place where you're really happy. And if you find both, that is, uh, that is a career. Forget about titles, forget about money. All of these things will come. So look for what you're good at and look for what makes you happy. What a wonderful end, uh, coming back to your mom and, uh, and the <laughs> first question about your family, childhood, Jesper. It's been, it's been wonderful to have you on the podcast and thank you so much for sharing all those moments thank with us. Special. Thanks a lot. Thank you for the opportunity. Have a nice day. Thank you, Jesper. Thank you. Thank you.